Today we're going to watch A Beginner's Guide to Music Theory. Now, of course, music theory is one of the scariest topics for musicians. <laughs> Now, this video is done by Inspire Aspire. You can check out their channel below. And the video has 1.3 million views, so it must be good. Or is it? We'll find out. Now, along the way, I'll try to relate the concepts to the greatest instrument in the world, the guitar. <laughs> A beginner's guide to music theory. Here we go. I was never really taught music theory, at least not in a classroom setting. My music theory knowledge is completely self-taught, mostly by watching videos online just like you're doing right now. So while I may not possess the same knowledge as someone with a formal education, I do know what it's like to be someone with no prior knowledge looking to learn, and maybe just not knowing- The internet is all you need these days. You know, I went to music school for five years. But I've also learned a lot just from watching videos on YouTube. It's amazing how much you can pick up. Where to start? So I'm here to hopefully guide some of you beginners out there as a fellow peer and attempt to teach you the basics of music theory. To do this, I'm going to split this video up into four main sections where I'll cover what I believe to be the most important aspects someone with little music theory knowledge should learn. Whether you're looking to write your own music, play an instrument, or produce your own songs, I think this video may help you learn a little bit more about music theory. So to begin, let's talk about tempo. Tempo is the pace of a song. Is it fast or is it slow? A beat is a standard unit of time of music. Whenever you tap your feet along to a song or whenever a metronome ticks, that lands on a beat. The tempo is then measured in BPM or beats per minute, which determines how many you get it. In general, a higher BPM means more beats more frequently, resulting in a faster song. Slower BPM makes for a slower song. Generally, you'll work with the best tempo is it's got to be 69 beats per minute, or sometimes I practice at 66.6. <laughs> with anywhere from 40 to 250 BPM. These numbers are completely arbitrary, but the point is you won't ever really have a need for anything outside is fast that range. AF. Time signatures expand upon this and determine how the music is to be counted. These are often written like fractions, with the top number representing how many beats will lie within a bar, and the bottom number determining the length of note to count. The most common time signature... I think this is like where music theory gets its rocket science comparison, you know, it being really complex, the, the math aspect. Aspect. But time signatures, I mean, I don't know rocket science, but I don't think it's anywhere as complicated as rocket science. I'm just going to be honest. Signature is 4-4. Four, four. This means we count four beats in a bar, and the lengths of notes within this bar must add up to the equivalent of four quarter notes. Granted, we can use any combination of notes and any combination of rests to fill up this space as long as they add up to the equivalent of four quarter notes. Sound confusing? That's because it is. If we were in the time signature 3-4, we would count three beats in a bar that are the length of three quarter notes. But if we were to double both of these numbers and use 6-8, that's actually different than 3-4 because remember, we're musicians and not mathematicians. If any of this went over your head, True. just use 4-4. Four, four. Frequencies. This is a note. Stick with 4-4, four, four, kids. A pitch and a duration. Pitch is the particular frequency of a sound measured in hertz. This determines how high or low a note is. Someone somewhere then decided to assign arbitrary names to pleasant sounding frequency values as the first seven letters of the alphabet. Any frequency value that is an exact multiple of one of these notes is also considered the same pitch, just played either slower or faster. For example, 440 hertz corresponds to the note a. But so does 880 hertz, since this is the same pitch, just played twice as fast. The gap between these two notes is called an octave. Octaves. That's a good principle to relate to the guitar. Let's say, you know, most people know that's an A on the fifth fret of the low E string. If you play a power chord, your pinky finger is on the octave. Uh, so an A up an octave. And that's a good thing to kind of get your bearings on the confusing fretboard. So that's an A. Now when you get to the D and B string, you got to move it over one extra fret, which is a bit confusing. But that gives you another A. And so now you can kind of uh, navigate the fretboard with a little more confidence knowing how to find octaves. 
So to distinguish between these two notes, we often call them by their letter name and octave number. 440 hertz in this case is called A4 and is often used as the reference for tuning instruments. Notes. notes. A piano is a good way to visually represent notes, which is often why a piano roll. The piano is way less confusing than the guitar, by the way. So even if you're a guitar player, it's worth it to kind of have a basic understanding of the keyboard so you can absorb music theory concepts more easily. Roll is used in electronic music software as a way to draw in your notes, even if a piano Back isn't up the just a little bit here. A piano so four, notes. and is often used as the reference for tuning instruments. Notes. notes. A piano is a good way to visually represent notes, which is often why a piano roll is used in electronic music software as a way to draw in your notes, even if a piano isn't the instrument you're playing. The lowest note on a standard 88 key piano is A0. From there, every white note follows the Super pattern jealous, of I can't B, play that C, note. D, E, F, G, and then the next octaves, A, repeating until the end. The black keys are named according to their location compared to the key either to their left or right. To handle this, we use fancy terms called sharps and flats. Sharp means we go up to the next closest key, and a flat means we go down to the next closest key. The gap between each key on a piano is called either a half step or a semitone. For example, the black key directly to the right of C. So let's talk about sharps for a minute on guitar. Let's say, I'm not going to use F sharp because that's confusing actually. Let's go to the G on the eighth fret of the B string. So if you sharp it, that means you raise the note up one half step towards the body of the guitar. That's G sharp. Going back down to G, G flat, you go down to the seventh fret. So sharp is up, flat is down. Simple. Flat means we go down to the next closest key. The gap between each key on a piano is called either a half step or a semitone. For example, the black key directly to the right of C is one semitone above C and therefore called C sharp. However, as if this C weren't confusing enough sharp. already, the same exact note is also called D flat because it lies one semitone below D. So now yeah, this is called enharmonic equivalence. So if you raise C, that becomes C-sharp, but you could think about this note as being a lowered version of D. So it'd be D-flat. So C-sharp or D-flat. Oh, I'm losing it, Shred. Now, to really hit it home, let's quickly recap all the notes in any given octave, starting with C, C-sharp, D, D-sharp, E, F, F-sharp, G, G-sharp, A, A-sharp, B, bringing us to a grand total of 12 semitones in a single octave. 12 semitones in an octave. So the way that I like to do this is kind of like an interval exercise too. You've got five on G and eight on high E, and then keep playing that higher note as you go through each note, because that's going to train your ears in intervals as well as learning the notes. So that's a fun little exercise. Octave. Scales. Scales are a collection of notes that sound I love good scales. when played together. This note may sound fine by itself, but when played in succession with these other notes, Not so much. This is because it's not in the not same scale it. as the other notes and therefore is considered off key. The two most common types of scales are major and minor. Major scales generally sound happy, while minor scales sound sad. A scale has a root note, which it's named after. By the way, minor scales are the best. <laughs> For example, C major, arguably the most popular scale, is a major scale starting at C. This is popular because a C major scale uses only the white keys on the piano. You will recognize this as your Do Re Mi's. However, okay, so C major on the guitar, we start on C, and this is also a good fretboard exercise. So you're thinking about your notes, C, D, E, F. G, A, B, and C. You can try playing that in different spots on the neck. What this does is it gets you away from thinking in terms of that pattern that you memorized and actually learning the notes on the fingerboard. A scary concept.
However, a major scale can be placed on any root note. A nifty trick to quickly write any major scale is to draw in notes on all the white keys starting from C and ending at C. Then drag that to your desired root note. For example, this is a C major mm. scale, and now this is an E major scale. Similarly, writing a minor scale is as simple as drawing in all the notes on all the white keys starting from A and ending at A. Then drag that to your desired root note. This is an A minor scale, and now okay. this is a G minor scale. Your gut may be telling you that there's no difference between these two scales, since all I did was draw on the white notes, so they're the exact same. The crucial difference here is where I started. The gaps between the white notes will be offset depending on what note I started from. This process can be repeated for each This is really interesting. You guys have to let me know what you think of this in the comments. Um, is the visual aspect of what he's doing. I'm curious as if you find that helpful or not. Uh, so minor scale, you know, we flat the third. Uh, so we had C major before. Now with C minor, you flat that third and that's what makes it sound minor. <laughs> so sad root note. For example, drawing in all the white notes from D to D results in what's called a Dorian scale. But Ooh. if you're just starting off, I'd recommend sticking with only major and minor scales for now. Chords! Chord Hold on. Dorian is such a great scale. That's David Gilmore's favorite scale. Uh, so D, Dorian. And I, I use pedal tones or repeated pitches uh, to really soak in the sound. So... D Dorian, I'm playing here. Beautiful sound, right? Starting off, I'd recommend sticking with only major and minor scales for now. Chords! Chords are multiple notes played in harmony at the same time. The most common type of chord consists of three notes, and therefore is called a triad. A chord is named after its root note and its quality. For example, this is a C major chord. And what is a C major chord on the guitar? Um, that right there, I, I know we're used to the open position stock voicing there, but it's a little bit harder to, to make sense of the structure of the chord because there you have five notes. So just the, the primary notes on the chord, you have fifth fret on G, fifth fret on the B string, and third fret on the high E. That's your C major chord. If you want to make it C minor, take the middle note down a half step. So C, E flat G. Let's go back to major. You can make it augmented by raising that fifth. Or if you go to minor, you can make it diminished by lowering the fifth. And that's really all you need to know in terms of triads. Those are the four types right there. Major, minor, augmented, and diminished. Let's continue. It's quality. For example, this is a C major chord. An easy way to remember how to make major chords is to pick your root note and draw in another note four semitones above that. And then finally, one more three semitones above that note, or a total of seven above your root. Another, even quicker way to remember major triads is to draw in a major scale using the trick previously described. Uh, let's pretend I want to be in F major. Now, pick any note to be the root of my chord, let's say A sharp. From here, draw in a note at every other key in the scale moving upwards. In this case, we skip over C, the next highest note in the F major scale, draw in a note at D, skip over E, and draw in a note at F. For this reason, the major chord is referred to having the pattern of 1, 3, 5. So chords are derived from scales. If you have C major, to get the C major chord, you're basically, like he's saying, you're skipping the second note and going to the third note, and then you're skipping the fourth note and going to the fifth note. That's what makes a chord, and you can start on any degree of the scale and do that skipping sequence every other note, and you get all the chords in that key. Voila! F. For this reason, the major chord is referred to having the pattern of 1, 3, 5, since our root is the first note, and from here we use the third and fifth notes in the scale, respectively. We now have an A-sharp major chord, and just like magic, A it sharp also major. 
Whoa. By the way, we don't really use A sharp major. That's a, there's no such thing as uh, the key of A sharp major. That's just like a gnarly thing to think about. Uh, so normally we talk about it as B flat major. That right there. But yeah, you could call it A sharp major if you really wanted. The problem with A sharp major is the way that it's spelled, you're going to have A sharp, and then you're going to have C double sharp. And then you're going to have basically an E sharp here, which is F. It's just awkward to think about it. Effectively, we now have an A sharp major chord. And just like magic, it also follows the pattern we previously described, where the gap between the root and the second note is four semitones, and the gap between the root and the third is seven. And making minor triad chords is also very similar. In fact, the only difference from a major triad is you drop the second note down by one semitone. So to make a B minor chord, for example, draw in your root note at B, move up by three semitones, again, rather than four in a a major chord, and then your third note four semitones above that. Again, this is still a total of seven semitones above your root. From here, we have a B minor chord, and yes, this is still okay. The one so above your B minor your root from here is B D and F sharp, and you can think about it as you know deriving every other note from the B minor scale, B D and F sharp. And trying to think about, you know, different ways to play that across the fingerboard is a good exercise. Can you play it on the low E string? Can you play it uh, on the A string? Can you play it on the D string? Can you play it on the G string? And uh, the G string. Yeah, we'll stop with that one. Ha 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 ha. Here we have a B minor chord, and yes, this is still the one three five pattern if you're in a minor scale. The difference between major and minor chords is small in terms of only being off by one semitone, but they make a world of difference in the tone they create. From here, chords can be expanded upon to be spiced up a little bit. For example, a C major triad has the notes C, E, G. Recall, these are the one, three, and five notes in the major scale. If I were to add the note B, this is now a C major seven chord since I added in the seventh note in the scale in addition to my triad from here you can use the tricks covered in this video seventh chords all right uh, so C major seven that is just adding that seventh uh, to you know the root there initially with C major you have C E and G then you're just skipping one more note in the scale so again it's just derived from scales because you're playing now the one, the three, the five, and the seventh degrees of the scale. Another way you could voice this would be like that. On the starting the D string, that's ten, nine, eight, seven. to write chord progressions or melodies that are in key and sound good together, and you'll know why. I think that's the best part about music theory. I used to be able to cobble something together when producing music when I didn't even know any music theory, but it would just take way too long and ultimately mm. not even it's sound just, that good. Yeah, However, what he's saying right there, that's the way I think of theory. It's a shortcut to get the sound that you want. Once I took the time to pick up the basics of music theory, my songwriting improved tenfold. So hopefully this video helped you gain 100%. a little bit of knowledge in some sort of aspect. If you want to catch future videos I make just like this one, feel free to subscribe. Otherwise, best of luck. Thanks for watching. Are you any less confused about the topic of music theory now? I want to hear your thoughts on this video below. What are you struggling with in particular when it comes to understanding music theory? Now I have an hour-long music theory course I'll put in the description below that goes into more depth into the topics that we covered in this video. I also talk about how to read music, intervals, scales, key signatures, jazz chords, and rocket science. <laughs> like this guy was saying, the purpose of music theory is just to get the sounds that you want. It's not a system of rules that's telling you what you can and can't do. Remember, at the end of the day, if it sounds good, it is good. <laughs>